step outside a state-based movement and build a national political movement. Well, the reason it tried to move outside was because it said that there was a demand for that. People wanted them to move, to move beyond. In any event, they spread out through these other 17 states in the, in the farm belt of the, of the United States. They also moved the headquarters to St. Paul from Fargo, which gave some people cause for concern because that just sent that the base, some, some folks said that that just moved the seat of North Dakota government back where it had always been. In any event, as part of their interim activities, they also attempted to continue to develop the alternative economic institutions to serve the people of North Dakota. Things like legal, legal owned banks, a consumer store systems, newspapers, the whole business. Now I'm running real short of time, I better move quick. In the 1919 session, they had total control. The continued organizing and the continued attempt to bind the people together enabled the, the nonpartisan league to control the state government of North Dakota, with the exception of only the superintendent of public instruction's office. Among the things they passed during the so-called Farmers Legislature of 1919 were the bills that became known as the New Day in North Dakota. They created an, a state bank, a state mill and elevator, a weights and measures inspection program. They exempted farm improvements from taxation. They created a home builders association to attempt to provide money for building houses in localities for working people. They created a county newspaper law, one county newspaper uh, elected by the people in each county in North Dakota. In other words, removing political patronage from the county commissioners. They reorganized state government in many, many ways, consolidated boards, instituted new practices for hiring, did a whole n range of progressive activity within the state of North Dakota, changes in government. The object was to try to put into, into place a government of, by, and for the majority that would serve the interests of the majority of the people in North Dakota. Well, now for the bad news, and I got two minutes for it, I guess. The opposition had not, of course, been inactive, and the League had never done its educational work as well as it should have. As a result, after 1919, schisms within the organization, various people broke away. Uh, Attorney General Langer decided that he didn't like Townley's leadership anymore and broke away from that. The agricultural depression cut the incoming funds for the League. The League had difficulty selling the state bonds to finance these businesses. And the opposition's propaganda continually picked up on the bossism within the nonpartisan league, painting the, the organization as Bolshevik and as any anti-democratic uh, term that they could use, that they could find. The league, in response, developed a continued hardline mentality, which led to a real uh, vicious political era in North Dakota. I think that uh, this, lack, this kind of response by the League also caused people to fall away from it. Quickly now, the legacy of the first nonpartisan League in North Dakota, a modernized state government, a generation of leadership, Langer, Frazier, Nye, Sinclair, William Lemke, the whole business, an insurgent tradition that continues to the present day, and finally, a legacy the, popular, the sense of popular uprising against unresponsive government and leadership. Right now in, in North Dakota, they say that if you want to start a farmer's movement, all you got to do is get two farmers together and a glass of beer. And it's, this is largely as a result of the Nonpartisan League's insurgent, cultural, ba culturally based legacy of change from the bottom up. In summary, let me say that the League was an attempt to establish a government of, by, and for the, the farmers, to build and create a system of alternative institutions owned by the state in the name of its people, and an attempt to do for the people what their established partisan leaders had not done. Thank you. Thank all of you. 
there was one thing that uh, Larry was a little too genteel to say. One of the charges raised against the League in 1919 by its opposition was that the League was going to pass a law in which any returning veteran could have his will with any maiden of his choice. That was the type of uh, propaganda used against them. Uh, we have uh, several minutes for discussion and questions. I wish we had more, but uh, those of you who do have questions and, and or, or statements to make. Would you uh, uh, come to the microphones and uh, ask any questions? You can direct them to any member of the panel here. Are you all that hungry? <laughs> Could you go to the mic? <laughs> During that time that women were also fighting for the right to vote, that couldn't vote, could somebody please, you know, highlight what their role was with the nonpartisan league? Uh, the question uh, centers on the role of women with the nonpartisan league. Uh, Who would like to field that? Uh, I'll, take a, I'll take a stab and then see what uh, Larry can do. Um, there isn't, is this working? There, there isn't very much, uh, there has not been very much research on the Women's Nonpartisan League. Uh, I've spoken with a couple of older women who had been in it, and uh, one story that uh, a person by the name of Maude Carlson gave me was that uh, oftentimes the, uh, the women would, have, uh, would accompany their husbands to some of the political conventions that the League had. And, uh, at, at one convention at a large hotel in Bismarck, a number of the women were outside the lobby. And uh, since they were not inside on the convention floor discussing politics, they began to do it right there in the lobby. And uh, legend has it that is how the, uh, the, the women's group was formed. Uh, I have a feeling, my suspicion is, that the, the role of women in the weed uh, is, is one of the most uh, central reasons for its success. But, uh, there hasn't been very much done on that. Uh, conversely, uh, the role of women in North Dakota politics may also be a reason why the, the, the we've lost. Uh, it has been suggested by one person that during the recall election in 1921, when the league lost, that the, uh, the anti-league forces, which uh, was the Independent Voters Association, were able to get their women to the polls. And uh, a good part of that because most of them lived in the cities. And what the League had tried to do was to, to pass a law within the legislature allowing polling, uh, the polls to be open two days. So if a man went to vote, left the farm, went in to vote, uh, the woman would stay home and take care of the children and vice versa the next day she would go and vote and he would stay at home. But the League lost that, uh, lost that piece of legislation. But I would say there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And, uh, is, is probably central in the history of the League. I'd just like to add that uh, the League consciously, from, from the beginning of the Nonpartisan Leader, which is probably the best source for non Nonpartisan League history, the League consciously deals with the concept of the family farm, not just the men, the women as well. There is a, a women's page in the Nonpartisan Leader that talks about organizing and talks about new developments in home technology, new developments for canning, and all of these things that were considered as women's work with the men. That particular, uh, on the farms during that period. Uh, the, the League in 1921, or not, excuse me, 1920, runs a woman for state auditor and runs several for the state legislature. And this is, you know, the, the, the second, the, the transition period of the League from 1921 through about 1930, and then the second League, which is the League created and fomented by William Langer, almost always has women on the ticket and almost always uh, pays a lot of attention to the women's vote and the women candidates. I'd like to say on that question, when the, uh, when the League moved into South Dakota, and Clarence uh, probably knows more about this, m much more than I do, uh, one of the top two leaders of the League in South Dakota was a strikingly beautiful woman. I can't think of her name right now. I'm sure Clarence can. And I believe she was a candidate for governor of the League at one time. Do you remember that, Clarence? Ears. Ears. No, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't Homer Harris. It was no, not Homer. It's Dad. No, the woman. The woman, the woman who ran for governor. Daly. 
Alice, Daly. Alice Lorraine Daly, who was a, a very effective political leader for the League in South Dakota and was, as I say, a candidate for governor. Question? Yeah. Yeah, in uh, North Dakota and any of the other states that the uh, League expanded to later, was there any organized attempt to uh, reach out to uh, the uh, emerging labor unions, to the working class in general, and uh, why wasn't it more successful? I'll take a stab, although I'm sure that uh, the Minnesota historians can uh, ex explain it much better than, than I. The nonpartisan league very early decided, uh, went after the labor vote in North Dakota. They formed the North Dakota Labor Nonpartisan League in 1917. And a fair share of its legislation was designed to assist laboring people, the anti lean laws and things such as that. Uh, in North Dakota, the, the work with labor was not as successful as it probably could have been because there just simply weren't that large a percentage of working people in North Dakota, laboring people, they, uh, wage workers in the state. In other states, such as Minnesota, in 1917, 1918, they are consciously trying to make alliances with labor organizations. And to some extent, they are successful. Uh, I think the Farm Labor Party in Minnesota comes directly out of the, uh, of the, the people who at one time could the people who were in the nonpartisan league in the rural districts and those who were labor oriented in the urban districts. And I'm sure that there are others here who could speak much more succinctly to that. Just uh, one addenda to that, uh, very much so that we was interested in, in getting labor uh, to support them. In Montana, which was perhaps the third in importance in the, of the weak states, uh, the, the key to the league's success was whether they could gain the support of the copper miners in Butte. And, uh, Although they did that in 1917 in the elections there, the uh, Butte Copper Union was crushed by the, by the bosses in 1917 and 1918, and uh, there was uh, simply nothing for which the we could build upon. Alfred Knudsen, who was the league organizer in, in Washington, formed a tripartite alliance which included the State Federation of Labor within the league. Clarence, you had a comment? The comment I would like to make is that all the historians belittle the role of terror and, and suppressive legislation by the government in the collapse and, and decline of the League and of the Socialist Party. For instance, in the state of South Dakota, they claimed three, the Socialist Party claimed 3,000 members in 1916. At, at about 16 years later, in 1932, there was just one local left in the state of South Dakota, and that was among the Finns near Frederick, South Dakota. And these people that were, that were suppressed and terrorized, many of them sent to jail, dozens of the, uh, of the organizers of the Nonpartisan League were tired tarred and feathered all over the country. For instance, uh, in this uh, biography of uh, Charles Lindbergh Sr., who was for 10 years a congressman in South Dakota, or North, in Minnesota, and who was the lead candidate for governor on a couple of different occasions, he, his meetings were broken up by mobs led by the Home Guard, and, and in many cases, he was, they used rifles and, and shot at the cars uh, that, in which he was traveling. Now, what I'm gonna say about, for instance, the character of the people in South Dakota who were intimidated and terrorized. In 1932, when the, when the depth of the farm crisis arose, I happened to be the secretary of the Communist Party of South Dakota, and in the period between November of 1932 and 1934, we recruited 450 members into the Communist Party, and they were recruited only in those, par on those parts of South Dakota where the old Socialist Party had been in existence in 1916. And let me tell you, these people were by no means cowardly. I witnessed their uh, they and other farmers who worked, worked with them, I witnessed the, the uh, disarming of uh, 19 deputy sheriffs. This, this story, by the way, is told in, uh, in Studs Circle's book, Hard Times. 
And uh, <clears throat> so time and again, they throw sheriffs into the uh, water tanks who attempted to uh, bid at, at these uh, Sears Global sales. So they, they and the thousands of people in, uh, in South Dakota who participated in the stopping of these foreclosures and so forth were very courageous people. But they were intimidated and terrorized to where they didn't dare maintain their Socialist Party locals after, after uh, about 1919. I think the role of terror is, is also graphically exemplified during the 1917-1918 World War I hysteria in comparing Minnesota and North Dakota. Whereas in Minnesota there was a lot of attempts to tar and feather, and actual tar and feathers of league organizers and railroadings out of town and jailings and sedition trials and the whole business. In North Dakota, the lead, the administration had a commitment to, to civil liberties of such that this did not occur. And when the sedition trials were brought up, they were usually dismissed. So it makes a difference whether it's official terror or unofficial terror. And in these other states, it was largely official terror. Bill? I'd like to add one more point to them, the one that Clarence and Larry have been making about harassment uh, during World War I Europe, that there's a whole section of the country that we haven't talked about that had a strong agrarian socialist movement. That's in the Southwest. Uh, Oklahoma had more members of the Socialist Party in the 1910 era than any other state in the country. I think in 1912, uh, the only state that had more members was New York State. So there was a strong agrarian socialist movement in Oklahoma uh, particularly. And the World War I experience was uh, devastating uh, to that movement. That I think generally in, this, in the Great Plains region, the interference with the males that occurred during World War I along with uh, the local harassment. Sometimes it wasn't official, it was a vigilante type harassment, resulted in the uh, disruption and breakup of this movement, and that hundreds of locals uh, disappeared in the World War I era uh, in this general region. Thanks, Bill. I, there, for those of you who are interested, there are a couple of quite good books on uh, agrarian socialism uh, in the Southwest, one by James Green and another one by Gavin, Bur uh, Gavin Burbank, uh, who, who studied the movement in Oklahoma and other states. In 1914, the socialists got 21 percent of the vote for governor in Oklahoma, for example. Question? I guess this question addressed to Clarence or Larry both of them. Do you give any validity to uh, Lipsitz's one crop hypothesis that generate agrarian protest movements insecure? Excuse me. The insecurity you're lying in a single crop or in like the wheat, the wheat crop in Saskatchewan, North Dakota, uh, a wheat. <coughs> the wheat. <coughs> Excuse me. The wheat crop areas in Minnesota, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas is giving rise or generating like the populist movement, equity, uh, other movements such as, such as those. I'll butt in and make a stab. No. Uh, the, uh, the socialists in Oklahoma, in southern Oklahoma, were also cotton farmers and uh, as well as wheat farmers. It's movements do not come from hard times. Movements do not come from uh, growing the same thing. People make movements, and movements need to be organized. Organized. And I think uh, to counterpoint what you said, uh, uh, Lowell, about the two books on the Oklahoma Socialist Party, I don't think either of them tell us very much of where the movement came out of. And I think in Oklahoma, the case was that the people were organized uh, initially by the Farmers Union, and they became radicalized through their experiences in the Farmers Union. That's the only way you have a socialist movement in Oklahoma. You don't have a movement by giving somebody a pamphlet. There has to be more to it than that. Yes. Let me just add a word about the Minnesota experience. I don't think it's going to be covered here in any panel other, other than uh, today. Uh, and Larry is essentially right that the labor movement in 1916 and 17 and 18 did organize a working man's nonpartisan league very consciously as a counterpart to the farmers' nonpartisan league. They began working together politically, and in 1918 they supported Lindbergh in the Republican primary. 1920, they again uh, supported candidates in the Republican primary, as uh, was going on in North Dakota. But it, the state law then permitted them to turn around and file as independents after they lost the primary election, which they did do. 
Then they ran its independence in 1920. Uh, uh, Shipstead, I believe, was the leader who did that. In 1922, then, they decided to run as independents in the first place. So we elected in Minnesota Shipstead to the U.S. Senate and two congressmen, Qualley and, and Wayfold, to, to Congress. Now this, again, is quite a, uh, an important victory to elect a U.S. Senator and two congressmen uh, just within three or four years after you uh, began organizing. <coughs> And the next year, they, are, they elected in a special, uh, special uh, election another U.S. senator. So by 1923, they had both U.S. senators from Minnesota, and they had two congressmen in office. In 24, they officially organized, uh, after some, a good deal of, uh, of tension and discussion, by this time, Tomley had gone right to, he, he vacillated, as I would say, to the, to the right, and was opposed to forming a third party or going the independent route. And uh, he wanted to work with the old-fashioned, uh, the Gompers labor faction and reward your enemies, uh, uh, punish your enemies and reward your friends and be both political parties. But in 1924, they officially went farmer labor. And uh, then not much happened until 1930 again when Floyd Olson ran for governor. And then beginning in 30 to 38 with Olson and then Governor Benson from 36 to 38, uh, this was sort of the high, uh, the heyday of the farmer labor uh, party in Minnesota. Uh, so, um, and there's a whole story here too about how uh, <coughs> all of this evolved. But uh, again, the root of it goes back to the Nonpartisan League in North Dakota, and this equity organization was also being organized in Minnesota prior to the uh, what is going on in North Dakota. So you have kind of a parallel development in the two states. And again, someone is quite right that there was official repression by Governor Burnsquist, a Republican, in 1917 and 18, where they uh, were the committee for of some, I can't think of the name of it. But again, this official rep repression helped to polarize people and almost drove people, especially Germans and certain ethnics and Swedes, into the nonpartisan league and into the farmer labor movement. And, and so uh, you have this kind of a paradox where the repression in this particular state, in Minnesota, helped to, helped to polarize things. In most states, it helped to destroy the movement. And one word then about women. Again, we had a number of women leaders emerge in Minnesota that, uh, back in this period. Uh, one of whom was Merida Lesseur, who you will meet here. Her mother, uh, Marion Lesseur, uh, came out of this period and was an active uh, uh, woman's leader. And she had taught, maybe uh, Merida will talk about that, but she had taught at the uh, Debs' um, labor college down in Fort Scott, Kansas. And uh, Susie Stagelberg and uh, Eva Bellish, there were quite a number of prominent women leaders who, who uh, came out of the, um, the nonpartisan league movement of the ninth and, and the anti-war movement of this period. So, uh, and I think people in our state are starting to study some of these things. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, something that the second farmer labor senator from Minnesota said uh, supposedly in his uh, maiden speech on the floor of the Senate. Magnus Johnson supposedly said, what we have to do is seize the bull by the tail and look him square in the eye. Uh, I have to uh, look the bull in the eye and uh, say that uh, Marilyn is hovering over me. Perhaps we could have one more question. Okay, if we don't have another question, maybe Marilyn has something she wants to say. I don't mean to interrupt anything. I just want to make an announcement about lunch that it's moved to a different room, 250 and 252, and there are a few tickets left for lunch, and there are many tickets left for dinner. But I'm sorry the way I broke in here and took away from from what they had to say, and I just want to say thank you all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>